Hello everyone, I'm Eamon Connor and this is IAPA. Welcome to the webinar program. Today's webinar is produced by IAPA's Europe, Middle East and Africa office in Brussels, Europe. So good afternoon if you're joining us from Europe and good morning if you're joining us from the US and a, a good day if you're joining us from anywhere else around the world. We're pleased to offer this webinar session as a free benefit of your membership to IAPA and we thank you for joining us. Our topic today is Scroll, Swipe, Click, Share, Innovative Ideas for Marketing Your Attractions This Summer. And we're going to explore what trends and tools that attractions marketing professionals are employing this season to reach the right audience with the right messages. We'll examine how attractions are exploiting digital media and mobile apps to engage with audiences. We'll explore the gamification of marketing and promotions. We'll see some case studies from Lisa Burke's successful and innovative marketing campaign for its Helix Coaster and its new Aerospin attraction and will illustrate recent trends in successful marketing tactics. Helping us explore this subject is Erwin Tate, social media and marketing expert at Flanders Leisure Academy in Belgium and Robert Ardvidsson, head of marketing at Lisaberg Amusement Park in Sweden. Before I introduce our speakers, let me take a few moments to familiarize everyone with the webinar format. We're pleased to offer this webinar session as a free benefit of your membership to IAPA and we thank you for joining us. During the session, all attendees will be able to watch and listen to the presentation, but will be muted. Please note that if you've chosen to participate in this webinar using a telephone for the audio portion, uh, long distance or international toll charges may apply. There's no charge to participate using the audio system of your computer. Now, if you have questions for the speaker, please type into the questions box that you'll find in the bottom uh, right-hand screen. Please note that the questions were, are viewable only by IAPA staff and not by the presenters. You may enter your questions at any time, however, they won't be addressed until the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. And now at this time, IAPA would like to ask for your help. If you have multiple people viewing the session on one computer, it would be very helpful to know how many people are participating. Please respond to the polling question that you should see on your screen now by clicking on the appropriate response. And while everybody's doing that, let me uh, give you a little heads up on some further webinars that IAPA is going to be offering in the next few weeks. Next week, March 23rd, we'll be offering a webinar on preparing your water park for a successful and safe 2016 open day. On, on March 29th, we'll be doing a, a new webinar program with the IAPA uh, membership team, IAPA member benefits, products and services. And then on April 13th, we'll, there's an, a webinar on slips, trips and falls, risk management for family entertainment centers. And finally, on May 18th, we are doing a webinar as part of our leadership series, a conversation uh, with Jane Cooper. Details of all of IAPA's webinars can be found on our website. And uh, look for those. And thank you for taking part in the, uh, in the poll. Now, you see on the next slide, IAPA's got a standard uh, disclaimer. And uh, full details on that can be found on the, uh, on the IAPA website. Now, we are recording this program, and a streaming copy of it will be available on the webinar pages. Uh, it takes about 10 business days to do that, and as I app, an IAPA member, you can view our archive of past webinar programs and recordings. And finally, you can earn credit hours towards IAPA certification by participating in the webinar and in other IAPA educational programs and events. Details on IAPA certification can be found on the events and education page on the IAPA website. And now to today's program, I'm pleased to be joined by Robert Ardvidsson and Norman Tates. Robert Ardvidsson is head of marketing at Lisaberg and a member of the management team. He joined Lisaberg in 2014 and his key responsibilities include group brand strategy, marketing communications and business development with an emphasis on digital strategy and implementation. Prior to joining Lisaberg, Robert held different senior brand management and e-commerce positions within retail and airline industries such as Team Sportia and the SAS group. Erwin Tate is a coordinator and researcher for Flanders Leisure Academy. He lectures, researches, consults, and publishes about the leisure and theme park industry, specializing in social media analysis and management for leisure companies and organizations in Belgium. He also lectures at the leisure management faculty of the Association of KU Leuven. In addition, he writes articles for different trade journals 
and releases a podcast about leisure on Apple's iTunes. Robert Irwin, you're very uh, welcome to the webinar program. Robert, I believe you are going to begin, so I'm going to hand the reins over to you, and, and good luck. All right. Thank you very much, Shimon. Um, hi, everyone. First of all, thank you very much for attending this webinar. Uh, <clears throat> here we go. Well, uh, the next 20 minutes, I'll take you through a quick introduction to Liseberg and give you some examples on how we work in the marketing field at Liseberg. Uh, I will try to focus on presenting two cases where we integrate the analog park experience uh, with digital experience. Um, the Helix case, uh, which I will show you, won the Grand Award Best Integrated uh, Campaign in 2014, Brass Ring Awards, uh, at the uh, IAP Orlando Show. And the Aer Aerospin case is about to launch actually this spring. Uh, the reason for choosing this case is due to the fact that marketing is not what it used to be and we all have to think different in a, in a changing world. But uh, let me first start to uh, introduce Lisa Berg to you. Uh, Lisa Berg was founded in 1923. Uh, we have a long and proud history. In fact, we're owned by the city of Gothenburg and, uh, and by that we have two roles. Firstly, to be a natural, uh, natural meeting place for the people of Gothenburg, uh, where a city located park. Uh, secondly, to be a, a driver for the tourists, uh, tourism uh, to Gothenburg. Um, over the years, we've been through an, uh, a big evolution, going from a traditional fairground to a theme park on a very high international level. Uh, what's important is that our DNA is purely analog, almost like all other uh, amusement and theme parks, and has been so. Guests want to feel airtime on the roller coasters, hear the sounds of live music, and smell the fragrance of blossom-filled gardens. Uh, actually, we like to say that people come to visit our park to get a sort of near-life experience. Uh, by mixing a lot of attraction, uh, at this point more than 40 attraction, uh, attraction with uh, entertainment, retail, food and beverage uh, experiences. The brand essence of the Liseberg experience is actually comfortable disorientation. It's actually the one-liner how we would like to describe the Liseberg brand. You should uh, feel great but never actually know what's around the next corner, which is also inspires us uh, in the marketing field uh, when doing campaigns and, and uh, trying to develop messages and solutions. In total, we have 3.3 million guests uh, annually and at peak days, we, we, we can have more than 50,000 guests, guests in the park. Uh, what is really important and very interesting is that uh, not only our industry, but, but the whole world is changing rapidly. Uh, it's very disruptive. Uh, new business model ch uh, challenges existing models. Uh, in fact, we're an analog industry with a lot of digital opportunities. Uh, I will give you, uh, firstly, a little tip of a, a really good article, uh, uh, the link you see in front of you, uh, where they list actually nine trends for our industry. Uh, it's quite interesting to, to go through and read. But I will also give you another case. Uh, uh, it's a ski destination uh, in the Nordic region, Ski Star. They have been very much internationally rewarded for, for a, a very integrated digital experience. And what's uh, interesting and important by that is that they, they started with the, the guest experience, added the digital uh, perspective, and then reconstructed all other things like uh, uh, business system, logistics, and everything else. So, so please take a look at that if you have time further on. Uh, but if we go into the... Let's see what's happening now. Going to click, or maybe I did activate the, the link. We'll see what's happening, Eman or anyone. If you could stop that, um, yeah. If we could go back to the presentation, thank you. Here we go again. Um, so, uh, what is the core of the marketing change we're going through? 
well, the last 50 years marketing has relied on paid media, uh, it was an un unspoken fact that big campaigns beated small campaigns and the ad agency and the media agency was actually in charge. But uh, things are uh, happening the, the last few years. Uh, we're in the middle of a big shift that requires also uh, as marketeers to shift mindsets with focus on own channels. Uh, and this is actually uh, applicable on all sizes of brand owners and barks. Uh, today, in fact, fast beats slow. We have to be quicker and more relevant. Uh, in order to meet this, we have to take back ownership and control of the brand experience uh, in our marketing efforts in order to develop pro and produce actually relevant marketing. Social media is a crucial part of this and that will, Erwin, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the other set of, uh, session we'll come back to. Um, I will give you a little example. Um, I don't know if you heard about uh, Oculus uh, Rift. Uh, when launching Helix, a state-of-the-art roller coaster, I will come back to the case later with the Helix app, uh, we created a virtual uh, reality ride with the Oculus Rift technology. Uh, we used it at the actual launch event to give people uh, a chance to experience Helix in case they didn't want to go for a ride. It's the left-hand uh, uh, pic uh, picture to the, uh, to the left. And uh, I don't know if uh, somebody of you have heard about this guy uh, <laughs> screaming in the screen. Uh, he's actually a Swedish guy. He's from Gothenburg, my hometown. His name is PewDiePie. And uh, we tried to get him on the premiere day, but when you have more than 42 million followers on YouTube, either your ego is affected by this or you're a bit busy, or maybe both. Uh, maybe both. Um, anyway, we managed to get uh, PewDiePie to try the VR ride, and that clip has been viewed over 6.5 million times, which is, uh, which is in fact very good. Uh, if you look at the link, uh, you can see him riding the VR, Helix VR, uh, approximately 2.35 minutes into the video. Uh, when talking about the Helix case and, and how we do marketing at Lisabay, we often get the, get the question of, uh, it's, it's really good cases, on, but, but how do you manage to realize, uh, uh, realize uh, the, the cases and the project? What is it that, that make it make it work from project phase, from idea phase to actually deliver the, 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 the actual product? Uh, well, uh, we like to, to talk about the, a little model we in, in the marketing field. It's 70, 20, 10. Uh, it's a sort of a working model, uh, how to balance our efforts, uh, energy hours, money, and focus uh, in order to secure brand value and enhance the guest experience. 70% per uh, we, we put on the basic stuff. To, that is actually uh, in order to secure the cap budget, to reach all segments, focus on creating synergy planning, and, and be very efficient. That, that is everyday work. 20% of the time and money and energy, we, we're trying to move the categories marketing forward, and, and we're talking about the amusement park. Uh, we're trying to think uh, outside the box uh, with new channels, new channels, new messaging approaches, events, integrated communi communications, and so on. And 10%, it's actually breaking totally new ground. Think out of the box. And the Halis case is actually a result of the 10% focus we have uh, in the marketing department. So uh, now I will take you uh, through the first uh, of the two cases. Um, we call it Helix, the fun queue. Um, it's actually not an app among thousands, but in fact it's a unique gaming experience uh, integrated with an analog ride experience before and after the ride, but also uh, outside the park, uh, which the numbers uh, uh, really, really imp impresses us. Uh, okay, let me introduce Helix. Helix is, a, is a, as I said before, a state-of-the-art state of the uh, big roller coaster. It was voted as uh, Europe's number one, one uh, steel coaster last year. It's a uh, 30 million US dollar in investment, one of the biggest invest in investments ever uh, at Liseberg. Uh, our business objective was actually to increase guest volume, to find a, a way back to the teens, as well as uh, enable financial growth. Uh, we already had a very high guest satisfaction index, uh, 93, but wanted to see if we could challenge this as well. So, uh, 
we bought this amazing roller coaster, even though an investment of that size had to cover a much broader target group, of course, we have to focus on the youth, uh, youth segment. As in the, and as you know, it's a very uh, tricky uh, segment. Uh, over the years, we experienced a declining tri uh, trend in the youth segment, meaning guests between 13 to 24 years old. Of course, we knew some reasons, uh, main reasons behind this, but we didn't actually pay too much attention to it uh, and actually didn't do the right things to attract the, the teens. And uh, over the years, we almost lost half of the volume. Um, okay, let's go on. So if we take a closer look uh, at the youth segment, teenagers, uh, teenagers um, as Erwin will come back to you, uh, teens are indeed a very digital target group. Uh, but before we developed the concept and the, and the app solution, we also took a closer look at the segment to find some, some clues. If we look at Sweden, smart, uh, smartphone penetration among young people is, uh, is as high as 95%. And with more than 14 connected hours uh, each week on the mobile, together with the media consumption, like no other segment, this is a real challenge to reach and to get acceptance. And actually, the last word I said, acceptance is uh, one of the key words to, to, to think of and put a lot of energy when, when approaching teens. Uh, when I grew up, gaming was about Sega 8-bit. You played individually. Maybe you shared the joystick. If you were lucky, you had two joystick. Today, it's all about networked and socialized gaming. So social gaming is core. So the insight uh, based on this was to develop a communication concept and a solution relevant uh, to the target group. Um, okay, so we, we started with the concept development. Uh, based on the insight phase, uh, we realized that the target group is very much into some sort of escape from reality. But riding a coaster like Helix is also a sort of escape from reality. And we started to connect the dots. So uh, when connecting the analog world with the digital world, uh, we find the missing link. Uh, we come up with the concept, uh, Helix, the next level. And now we have the platform and could start the marketing work. So we thought. There was actually one big issue that we also started to think more and more of the, as time uh, was, was running towards the premiere day. And uh, in fact, uh, but when you launch a, launch, a, launch a coaster like Helix, you can expect some, some things. Uh, long queues, and this is not a, a rocket science, this is actually <laughs> what, what every other uh, park experience when, when they uh, launch a big time attraction. Long queues is a financial problem and a brand challenge to all amusement parks. We do not make any money and the guest satisfaction is, is actually at high risk. But if the ride is 1.5 minutes, what takes to make it worth to stand in line for almost two hours? And uh, at the premiere season, we almost had two and a half hours uh, long queues. So we, we started to ask ourselves, what do most people do when they're bored? Well, you pick up the phone. Uh, so we started to, to ask uh, ourselves some, some, some key questions. Uh, what if we could make the people perceive, uh, perceive less queuing time compared to the actual queuing time? What if we could make the guests interact with each other? And what if we could integrate the analog ride with a ride experience with a digital experience? What if we could link the new game idea with the actual ride experience? What if we could come up with a digital solution not that not just enhance the ride experience but also enable people to experience the ride outside the park? So uh, we we landed into a conclusion: Why not a game that handle all of this? So. Uh, We developed the app, the Helix, the game. You can find it on App Store. Um, it's a free game, and it consists of eight mini games representing different characteristics of the actual ride. So the loop, the the, the top pad spin, the inverted, uh, all those parts in the in the, in the real ride were uh, actually adapted into the game. Uh, but also the brand expression and the brand experience was, was also considered to, to be uh, streamlined and uh, aligned with, between each other. Um, you could of course practice uh, at home, but the real competition was given in the Helix queue line, integrated with the ride and synchronized with all other people in the queue line. 
Um, I'll go a little bit into details how, how it works. Uh, and uh, later on, the, I, I, will, I will share a link to a, uh, a case video where you can actually have the, this presentation very condensed. But in fact, uh, the access code to the game were given on screens at the queuing area. Uh, after a countdown, the game starts synchronized, meaning that everyone in the queue is playing the same game at the same time. A gaming round is one minute long and consists of five randomly selected games, making each individual game 12 seconds long. And after the round, uh, you can check out the scoreboard on the screen and see if you made it on, on the high score list. The list uh, reset, uh, resets after 50 minutes and the top score at that point will win an express pass. And uh, it, it's no exaggeration to say that the Helix app was received, uh, exceeded all expectation. I, I will tell a little bit about the result on the next slide. Uh, that summer, the app was one of the top five in Sweden downloaded apps. And, uh, and actually, more people have played the Helix game on the app than, than actually writing the, the, the real uh, Helix experience. And one little detail, thanks to the app, there, there has been less vandalism in the queue line. We have a pretty long queue line, but uh, it's, it's very clean, and, and uh, people from, from other parks notice that. How, how do you make it so, so clean and neat? And, and that is actually due to the fact that the app works. Uh, of course, we did a lot of testing before launching the app, and, it, and, and uh, after that, it's been quite stable. Uh, in fact, we didn't launch the app at the premiere day, we've done, uh, but, but uh, we, we, we waited one and a half months uh, to actually secure that the system and everything works. Um, okay, and now a little bit about the, the app results so far. Um, we have a population, population in Sweden of 9 million people, 9.5, uh, and 3.3 million people visit the park uh, every year. Out of that, it's 800,000 teens. Um, just a, a little bit of background, but so far, uh, and this is uh, numbers from, from yesterday, we have had 410,000 downloads. In the premier year, we had 250,000 downloads. Uh, the year after, last year, uh, was 160,000 downloads. This year, we hope to, uh, to exceed uh, at least 100,000 downloads. Uh, the average game time is 7.16 minutes. And uh, that's really good, we think, because you interact with, with the Liseberg and Helix brand, uh, which is also a sort of a brand building process. Um, we had by, by now had more than 1 million game sessions in the queue line and more than 2.1 million game sessions on other places, at home and uh, where else in the park. And in total, more than 3 million game sessions. 74% is returning players, a high loyalty. And uh, of course, initially we had a lot of hacking attempts. The, the first two, three months were a lot of people that trying to, to, to hack the scoreboard and hack the game and so on. But uh, together with uh, our partner is a little consultancy firm, firm um, stick a bit. We managed to, 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 to cover all the holes uh, quite soon. And uh, here you find the, the, the case video in English as well. Uh, if we're talking about the, the business effects, uh, of course, uh, it's not only the app and the, and, the, and the game, of course, the attraction itself contributed to, to a very good season, but uh, we had 99% awareness two weeks after the premiere. Uh, guest volume increased uh, a lot, uh, and uh, we took a, uh, took back a very strong position in the youth segment. So in one one season, we took back 10 years of, of loss in, in in the youth segment, which is very very good and and beyond our uh, uh, expectations. Uh, from a marketing perspective, we also uh, are very pleased with, with the outcome of this because now we have a marketing platform. Uh, we managed to establish this cost-effective cost marketing platform that not only worked in, in the premier uh, season 2014, but also worked in 2015 and also worked in 2016. This year, we, 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 we changed some of the mini-games, add some new feature to keep the app alive to a very, very, very low cost. And if somebody out there uh, wondering how, how the in investment, how, how big it was, uh, I would say 50,000 US dollars for the app development and uh, approximately 10,000 uh, $10, uh, dollars for the screen in the queue area. So it's a, it's a very, fairly small investment with a great impact. Okay, I'll go on. Uh, the next case is uh, 
is actually new to this, this year. Uh, this summer we uh, introduced a whole new area, the, the Lissaberry Gardens, uh, which you see here, uh, which, is, which in fact consists of a children's area with influences from the Victorian era. Uh, we also uh, launched this new attraction, Aerospin, uh, a concept based on the early pioneers of aviation. That's the tower you see in front of you. Um, okay, uh, a little bit about Aerospin. Aerospin is a 35 meter tower um, where you sit in aeroplanes. The gondola platform is elevated and goes round and round. The ride, it, ride is situated on the top of the hill, so one will be approximately 70 meters above sea level. And each aeroplane can spin manually, and this is this functionality is controlled by you. Uh, and we have a lot of, I, th I think it's 480 uh, people per hour, or 480 pilots per hour, uh, what, what we would like to say. You can have a very smooth ride, enjoying the high view, or you can have an insane spinning experience. Uh, what we heard, you can make the plan, uh, the, the, each aeroplane spin as much as 200 times during one session. But again, we ask ourselves, what, we, what can we actually do to amplify this concept and the right experience and also add some energy to, to the marketing? So, uh, referring to the Helix case, we did a sort of a copy-paste but tried to, to, to go that extra mile. And, it, we, and, and we think we have something here. Together with the technical department, concept development, we cooperated to develop a solution that even more integrated with the ride, um, and also had some features to meet the ride value change before, during, and after the, the, the ride, and actually more integrated in the marketing mix, uh, sort of traditional campaign initiatives and, and so on along the way. So let me present uh, how it works. Uh, the concept is, is based on an expression with strong linkage to the right concept, the early pioneers of aviation. Sorry, I have to go back, I think. Here we go. Um, it's an app with uh, three main features, before the ride and after the ride. Uh, at this stage, we're developing the app, building the queue line, and planning for the marketing and PR activities, such as launch party competition between famous YouTubers and, and, and uh, also the Aerospin Championships, which will come later on. Uh, those with the highest uh, total score in the Aerospin app will be invited to the competition. But before the ride in the queue line, you can, of course, you should download the app. You can pimp your selfie. Um, inspiration from a sort of a Snapchat context, add a lot of Aerospin attributes to, to a picture and share with your friends. You can learn to fly the Aerospin style, uh, different moments and levels, and get your certificate and challenge your friend. And after the, the, the ride, you, act, you can actually, uh, and here's the, the, the more or less more integrated with the ride experience compared with Helix. Uh, you type your aeroplane, gondola ID, and, and flight number, uh, which is given by variable codes, and you get your spin score, and you get your flight certificate with picture score and so on, and you can share and challenge your friend. I think that from a marketing perspective, this will be a very good uh, spin-off effect, and, and we, we think it's a, it's a very high shareable uh, level on this. So finally, my last slide to, to sum it up, uh, I think I'll approximately on, on, on time, but um, I hope that these input and cases from Elizabeth were useful and inspiring. Uh, when, when talking about organization, uh, I think it's very important to have a flat and informal organization where it's a culture to sometimes fail and to take initiatives. Of course, you should have an objective, some goals, but allow certain detours there are some interesting uh, questions that arise during a dialogue between different people from different uh, departments. Evolution doesn't stick to plan, always stick to plan, as you already know. And uh, a simple rule, start with the brand position, posi uh, proposition. What is the, the core essence of the brand? This is actually the, the core of the experience. And, and focus on guest value, trying to put yourself in the, in the guest perspective. And, uh, and, and finally, have fun and be willing to experiment. And for, for personal inspiration, uh, this link uh, later on. That, that's me. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Now it's time to, to uh, leave the, the, the mic to Irving. Please, Irving. Hello. Um, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Erwin Tatz, uh, speaking from Belgium. Um, and I'll be uh, telling you um, about social media. Now, is there anything about social media you don't know yet? If you go to any seminar on, on marketing, there's somebody talking about um, 
uh, social media. What I'm going to try to do today is present you with five insights on social media. Here's number one. Social media is all about trust. This is the Belgian trust. I live in Belgium, and, and here the government actually uh, polls lots and lots of people and, and, and makes an index of people that are more trusted and, and less trusted in our country. As you see, people from the fire brigade and doctors and teachers are um, all very well trusted uh, professions, while CEOs and priests and politicians don't have a lot of trust here in Belgium. Now this, this trust index, as you can see, consists of 19 different professions, but actually the, uh, the Belgian trust index is a top 20. That's because social media for the first time in, 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 uh, in a while was actually added as, as, as one of the things that people could be trusted. If I asked you, um, where would you put social media? Uh, then you would be probably surprised where the average person in Belgium would put social media. The, trust index, it's right here, with 97% trust. Why do I give you this example? It's because people really trust social media. Not the website, not, not Facebook, but they're surrounded by a network of people that they've chosen themselves. And they're surrounded by information from web pages, from social pages that they actually chose themselves to follow. And, and, and because of that, People trust a lot in what they see on social media. If you, your company, of your products are able to become part of someone's digital social network, you become part of that trust. Now, because of that, I mean, uh, especially when leisure companies start doing social media, they, 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 they try to think about what kind of actions can I do, what kind of things can I do to reach more people, and, and, and then there's always that tendency to start uh, um, doing commercial actions, contests and games, etc. Um, what I recommend is doing a, a, an informative post to commercial post ratio of 4 to 1 for every uh, uh, one post that has some kind of commercial incentives like a, a giveaway or, or, or just a commercial message of how good your venue is should actually put four non-commercial posts on Facebook or on Twitter or on or whatever social medium you're actually uh, using. Uh, if you do contests or games, make them short in duration. For instance, if you let people vote on their favorite picture from your park, don't let them vote for like two weeks or three weeks. Uh, make it a short contest of only a couple of days and avoid repetition of, of, of having the same commercial message repeated on your social networks uh, uh, over a short stretch of time. Insights too, there's way too much information. The average person here in Europe on Facebook has 364 friends and likes 178 pages. These friends and pages produce numerous messages. Actually, if you would read every single message that every single one of those friends and every single one of those pages generates in one single day, you would actually have to read over 2,000 different messages. Now, Facebook, for instance, knows this. And what it does, it, it, it stops showing you messages from every single page and every single friend. They actually use a special formula to determine whether a, a message from a page or a, a, um, a person that you follow is shown to you or not. This is called AdRank. And at, 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 at its most basic, this is how AdRank works. It's a formula that Facebook uses to show you whether a message is shown on someone's page or someone's timeline or not. The first um, elements that is important is the more affinity that the person has with a certain uh, subject, page or person, the more likely it becomes that a message, a post will be shown. Um, you want to, to make your followers involved because if you get your followers involved, if you, if you get them to like your post, they will actually get to see your post more often. If lots of people react on your post, uh, on your post, you will actually get to show those posts to more people. Now, because of that, you will uh, often ask them to share photos or terms, to share reactions. Be, be, be sure to always ask positive resp response questions. You don't want to, 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 to ask your audience something that might 
start a whole chain of negative reactions. Never ask, do you like our new attraction or did you enjoy your last visit to our park? Because there's always somebody who will not like attraction or will, who will uh, not have liked your, their last visit. Ask questions such as, such as what's your favorite park snack? Uh, it's not a yes or no question. You ask them a positive question to, to, to just, just name one snack that they prefer over the others. Same thing is, when was the last, last time you rode our coaster? A question like that, and I had a, a cool picture of your, your, your coaster, one of your coasters uh, uh, with that post. It asked them to, to give them a certain time, last week, last month, uh, uh, last year, uh, and, and it doesn't give them a chance to really give some, some negative feedback on your uh, social media account. Second important element of the edge rank formula is weight. What do I mean with weight? Not all posts are considered equal. A movie is actually considered as much, much better social content than just a photo. And a photo is actually considered to be much better social content than just an, a little bit of text. If somebody shares something that, that, that you've posted, then that's considered by Facebook to be much more important than if somebody just reacts to something you've posted. And if somebody reacts to something you've posted, that's, that's considered to be much more important than if somebody just likes something you've actually posted. So, what do you want to do? You want to make sure that you put a lot of movies there, put a lot of photos there. Uh, and important, when you start putting movies on your Facebook account, for instance, don't put your movies on YouTube and link them to Facebook. Because YouTube considers, uh, sorry, Facebook considers YouTube as a competitor. If, if you put a YouTube link in your, in, uh, on your Facebook page, then, 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 then what actually happens is you give the, the um, uh, follower the chance to actually go to YouTube and leave Facebook. Now, YouTube, which is owned by Google, is actually a competitor of Facebook. And because of that, Facebook actually prefers is that you actually upload your movies into their Facebook uh, platform instead of just linking them on YouTube. Third part of the edge rank equation is DK. And what am I uh, trying to say with DK? DK is the fact how recent my post is. If you if you just if you've just uh, put your post on Facebook and many more people will get to see it than after two or three or four hours. So you really want to calculate, you want to find out when is the most appropriate time to put my, my post online. Is it at 10 o'clock or at 2 o'clock or at 4 o'clock and I'll give you some, 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 some insight on how to do that. Insight number three, you can measure almost everything. This is uh, are all the months of the year, from January all the way up to December. It's actually a graph that, 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 that is, has been created by, by, by Facebook itself. And what it does, it shows the peak break of times according to Facebook statuses. And as you can see, when do relationships uh, uh, break up on Facebook? Well, uh, there's a peak here, right, uh, in spring. There's a, a little bit of a, a weird peak on the 1st of April, then just before summer and just because just before the end of the year and on april uh, on december 25th on christmas day that's actually the the, the the day of the year that the least people in the world actually change their relationship status on facebook i'm giving you this example to show you that facebook actually has a lot of information about 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 everybody and it can actually get you really interesting insights in how people behave now remember what i just told you i told you that it's very interesting to try to figure out what the most important time is when the most people that follow your page uh, uh, is online. There are actually a couple of really interesting uh, software programs or software services online that allow you to track that information. Um, to our customers, we, we usually work with Hootsuite, but Sprout Social and Wildfire and Edge Rank Checker are also very good tools uh, to do that. Hootsuite actually allows you uh, to, 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 to try a very basic uh, uh, version for free. It allows you to actually plan your Facebook, your Twitter uh, posts, and then analyze them, and to, to analyze your, your, your audience, and uh, to see how old is the audience, but also when, when is my audience of my page online the most. The peak and tendency times in Central Europe is uh, are Saturday night at, at uh, uh, 10 o'clock, 
Saturday night at 8 o'clock and Sunday night at 7 o'clock. If you put something online at one of those three times in, in Europe, in general, you'll reach the, 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 the largest audience. But of course, every single page on Facebook is different, and every park, every uh, leisure facility has its own unique uh, 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 visitors. So uh, you want to check out using programs such as Hootsuite, which is the best, uh, which is the best time for your page to post uh, uh, your message. Insight number four: um, some practical tips for more Facebook views. Um, it's all about conversation. You don't want just tens of thousands of people following you on Facebook. I mean, it's really easy to get tens of thousands of people following, to follow you on Facebook. Um, uh, you can pay Facebook to, 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 have, to have your page shown to, to, to tens and tens of thousands of people. But after a while, you, you'll notice that while you're, you're actually having 40 or 50 or 60,000 followers, only 2,000 or 3,000 or 10 thousand people actually get to see your message and maybe only a couple of hundred interact with them. It's not about likes, it's about selling tickets. And in order to sell those tickets, you will get you will try to get your message to your Facebook audience, to your Twitter audience as, as often as possible. Now that's why I say make sure to measure. Make sure to measure how many people you reach with your posts. And also, and you can actually use tools such as Hootsuite for that. If these people are more than just loyal fans, what we've uh, uh, learned is that many um, uh, leisure attractions, theme parks actually has a, have, have a, uh, a small but very de dedicated group of, of fans. That's usually a good thing, but of course if you, if you start analyzing your Facebook results and see that the same 400 people uh, uh, interacts, uh, let's say, for 80% with all of your posts, and of course you're really reaching a very small audience uh, uh, while you're actually doing in the thinking you're doing quite okay. And you want to also check whether your posts actually lead to conversion, to more site visits, to, 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 to more ticket sales. By, 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 by connecting your Facebook uh, with your, your uh, uh, company website, uh, you can actually use different tracking mechanisms in order to see whether somebody who, who found your information through Facebook actually ends up buying a ticket on your website. This is the magical sign. It's a question mark. Why am I calling it a magical sign? Because many uh, 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 researchers have actually um, uh, discovered that when putting a question in a Facebook post, people will like, stop scrolling their Facebook page and read the question. Um, uh, even if people don't give answers, even if people don't answer your question, they will read your post more often if it consists of a question than whether it just consists of a statement. Short posts are better. Facebook prefers to show shorter posts. Shorter posts enable Facebook to show more posts. And when Facebook is able to show more posts, it's actually able to, 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 to show more advertisements. The ideal length is about 55 to 99 characters. Only the first six lines of a message are shown. And after that, uh, um, um, the user actually has to interact with uh, uh, Facebook to get more information. Uh, as you see on my slide, less than 4% of all users do that. Um, uh, as you can see on this graph, uh, the, uh, the engagement that people have with posts starts to drop as soon as your posts uh, are uh, larger than 100 characters. Uh, the, you get the most engagement on really short posts uh, between 50 and 99 uh, characters long. And as you can see here at the end, uh, a post that uh, is, is longer than 250 or 300 characters, I'm not talking about words, just characters, actually gets very, very low engagement. Always add a picture. Even if you only want to say something short, pictures draw attention more than text does. And Facebook will, even if you just want to say to your audience, uh, tonight we're going to open an extra hour, uh, please enjoy the park. Even if it's, that's, that's just the only message you want to uh, put on your Facebook or even on Twitter, just add a picture. It will actually draw people more to your post. Facebook, Twitter will actually show your 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 post to more people and you'll get more engagement. Uh, there's also some guidelines for good pictures that you want to uh, use. Uh, you want to use large resolution pictures. 
at least 1,200 pictures wide and 628 pictures, <laughs> pictures high. But what I did here at the bottom, you find the link uh, to the official Facebook website that actually shows you the, 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 the exact uh, widths and heights and, and, and really good basic tips for uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, how, to, how to get more post engagement with your uh, pictures. Um, um, Choose pictures without wide borders. The background on Facebook is always white, and a picture that has wide borders makes less of an impression than a picture that is in full color and actually covers most of the screen. Talk to the reader. Um, uh, for instance, uh, don't, don't, don't tell them, uh, um, we have a new Halloween maze this year, but tell them, you can adventure our new Halloween maze this year. Don't talk about yourself, talk about your customers, talk about your readers, and then tell them about what they will actually uh, be able to do in your park, not what you have in your park. Talk about your visitors. Add a smiley. Facebook doesn't allow you to, to change the fonts, to add uh, uh, things like italics or boldface to a, a, a certain text. The only thing you can actually add that, is to distinguishes, your, that distinguishes your text uh, from other text is a smiley. If you put a smiley in a text, it changes into a little yellow hat and that makes your post stand out just a little bit more. Um, we do a lot of uh, advice and consultancy for, for uh, companies here in, in, in Belgium. And as you may or not uh, know, uh, Belgium is a language where two main languages are spoken, Dutch and, and French. If your customer base speaks more than one language, your customer only wants to read information in his or her language. So uh, we advise to, whenever possible, to create language-specific Facebook pages. We do not never recommend, for instance, our, our, our customers to, to, to post double language messages, uh, for instance, both in Dutch and in French. We recommend either making two different pages, one for the French audience, one for the Dutch audience, or to use the language target tools of Facebook. Facebook actually allows you to say, well, show this message only to those people who have their language settings set to French. Do never create posts that consist of the same message in two or more languages. And of course, this one, um, social media marketing doesn't stop when people buy their tickets. Create locations and moments in your parks that are worthwhile to share. People come to your parks with their mobile phones, let them use it, let, let, give them possibilities to, 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 to share your park experiences on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. Or, like Robert just told you, create inventive social games that let them interact with your product uh, and let them uh, uh, have an exclusive experience that they can actually only have in your park, uh, like, like the example from Lisa Burke. And always remember the three biggest fears of any 15-year-old are this, low battery, slow internet times, and uh, uh, bad Wi-Fi help them by actually uh, uh, creating places where they can recharge their batteries or by giving places in your park or venue where they can actually get in onto the internet for free. And that's also only the beginning, of course, of my story. Social media is still brand new. It's been around for only 10 years and we're learning every day about all the different possibilities that, that social media has. So my biggest advice would be keep up to date and, and you're doing actually a very good job by listening to the stories that Robert and I uh, uh, have been telling uh, today. And that's also my last insight. We don't have a choice. We don't have a choice whether we do social media. If you're not doing social media today or only doing it very, uh, uh, or you're only doing a little bit, uh, uh, step up your game. The question will, will, will be how well do you do it? And that's it. We're opening the floor for questions right now. Okay, well thank you Erwin and thank you Robert for two very interesting uh, presentations. We, we've got a, a few questions for, for, for both of you. Before we get into those though, I want to remind the audience that we have recorded this webinar. So if you want to go back and listen to the presentation again or a shirt with other folks, you can certainly do that. You can find that up on the, uh, in the members only section of the IAPA webpage. It takes about 10 days to post the recorded webinar, but we will do that 
along with a PDF of the uh, the presentations. Now, got a couple of presentations. I I, I think um, I think we'll start with you, Erwin, as you kind of wrapped up the the bigger picture of the social media environment. And a couple of questions came over, but uh, are, do you have any good examples, or who do you look to as far as uh, who's executing? A social media strategy really well. Is there anybody within the attractions business that you can point to and say, yeah, they've got a really good uh, handle on how they do social media? Obviously, other than Lisa Berg, because we've got Robert here, but is there anybody mm -hmm. any within the attractions industry that you can point to? And then just generally within the, within the uh, within the business world. Yeah, um, the, 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 the two very important tips here. If you really want to learn about social media. There's actually two really interesting pages that you uh, can follow. The first one is follow Mark Zuckerberg and himself. He actually allows people to follow him on Facebook and follow Facebook, the company itself, on Facebook. Um, uh, uh, both, uh, uh, pro it's one is a profile, the other one is a page, actually uh, give you lots of interesting information. I'm not going to uh, 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 refer to any of our, our own uh, uh, clients, but here in Europe, uh, uh, Europa Park is actually a really good uh, uh, example of a park with, 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 with a, uh, a very expensive social media strategy. They're actually uh, using uh, uh, different uh, pages, uh, different languages for their different uh, target groups. Uh, I would really recommend having a look at, 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 at what Europa Park is doing uh, within um, uh, uh, the um, language region that, that we are active in, but not one of our customers is uh, the theme park, the Efteling, uh, which actually has uh, also has different pages for uh, Belgium, for the Netherlands, uh, for, for Germany, for United Kingdom, uh, and is actually both on, on uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and YouTube doing uh, amazing things on social media. Okay, thank you very much for that. And then uh, a little bit more of a technical question. Um, can you speak to the volume of posts or the number of posts that you should do in any given day or in any given week uh, to keep your social media presence fresh? Yeah, we, uh, we uh, always recommend our um, uh, customers to at least post once each day. Um, and uh, that includes actually also the off-season, so even when you're um, uh, not open, keep posting. And there's a very good reason for that, uh, because Facebook also um, uh, considers how often you post as one of the, the uh, parameters for actually showing your posts more than, uh, to, uh, more than others. Um, meaning that, for instance, if you imagine that you're you're closing your park from October till March and you hardly post anything, well, what you'll have to do at the beginning of the season, you have to 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 invest a lot more, and with investing, I mean doing much more efforts to get your audience back than if you've been posting all the way. But we always advise to post at least once a day, once each day. Robert, do you have a, a, a thought on that about the the um, the frequency or the volume of posting that you guys do in Lisaberg? Yes, uh, in fact, uh, we we have uh, three to four posts posts a week. Uh, but but having said that, we were sort of a broad offering. Uh, we have eight nine different business areas and and and, and different also Facebook uh, uh, accounts. Or so so uh, we're trying to keep a red thread in the things, but also allowing us to 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 take some detours. Uh, sometimes it. We can meet ourselves in the in, in, in the doorway, uh, but uh, according to the guest experience, uh, we don't think that will bother too much. Uh, as long as you uh, you sort of go with uh, with the rules that Erwin is is, is talking about. Uh, if you follow those basic rules, I think you, you can do more than you actually uh, think you can do. Okay, and then I'll I'll stick with you, Robert, if you don't mind. Just a kind of a uh, Follow-on question: That can can you promote your park, or should you promote your park website on a social media network? Uh, well, I, I think it's inevitable uh, to to sort of promote your website through, through a social media network. It, it's it's all depending on how you work in, in daily daily life with with uh, campaigns, uh, postings, and, and other types of activities. Uh, we're currently uh, reworking our, our 
actually a total digital presence. We don't talking about the website. We're talking about the digital presence on, on different types of interfaces. And of course, social media social media is a very very important feature in the in the general digital interface uh, perspective. But uh, it's a process now. We, we're trying to 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 break some new grounds. And, and later this year, we will we will uh, present a new a new presence. Uh, of course, we, with the emphasis on, on on a traditional desktop website, but it will be responsive. Uh, it will be will be social media uh, integrate uh, integrated on on a very high level. All right. Can I go Are into that? Just yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, um, the question do is, uh, do I promote my website on social media? You have to remember that if uh, there's there's actually two sides to that. Um, firstly, um, every single company that's 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 on on uh, Facebook try to uh, create uh, call to actions for its readers, meaning it will actually try to get its uh, readers involved. In what it's putting on Facebook. As soon as you start promoting your Facebook, your, your, your website on Facebook, the main call to action will always be press this link so you actually go to our website. Now, Facebook doesn't like that at all because uh, every time you post your website or your link to your website on Facebook, you're actually giving Facebook's customers actually a chance to leave Facebook and, and, and spend some time on another website that Facebook considers it to, uh, considers competition. So if you refer to your website a lot, those posts will actually be shown less. There's a flip side to that. That's what I just told you. Um, sometimes you just have like a, a big message. You have lots, you have lots to tell. Now, what I also told you is that you will get much more engagement with shorter posts of less than 99 characters. And a good way to actually make sure that that you want you you, can, you you put your bigger uh, message online without actually putting too much information in Facebook is actually put your bigger message on a on a, on, on your uh, website and just refer to your website using 99 characters or less. Um, it, it, it's you will have to balance those two strategies and and, and the, the, the the both the positive and negative sides of these both strategies. Uh, in order to, to engage as many people as you can. Okay, thank you. Now, i got a couple of questions for you, Robert, relating to um, the Helix and the Aerospin case that you mentioned. Um, how long was it from the, from the concept, from the idea, to the execution, to you actually were ready to, 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 to uh, roll out the, the, uh, the promotion? Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about the Helix case. Um, the idea came up as late as, as uh, in March and we open in late April and uh, the launch date for, for the app and the, and the queue lane was in, in uh, beg beginning of June. Uh, so, so fairly quick but, but late according to uh, the premiere. Um, with regards to, to the aerospin, we, we started much earlier. We started with this discussion a few months ago actually in, in September, October when we, when we set the concept and the new attraction and so on. Uh, so now we're much ahead of schedule and, and are able to actually secure the, the, both the technical IT perspective but also the, 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 the whole solution in a much better uh, perspective. Uh, so, uh, I, well, it's all dependent on what, what type of culture and what type of project mentality, project, uh, mentality you have in your organization. Uh, at least we're, we're open to, to interact with each other. Uh, and all problems very quick, so I think two to three months is, is very quick uh, compared to what you actually should uh, consider to, to, to have. I think at least five to six months from, from start to, to execution. Okay, and that last comment about your sort of teamwork with, with across the departments in the, uh, in the facility is a good segue into the next question, which was, what, did you have any operational challenges uh, with folks in the queue lane or, or, or with uh, any other aspect of the actual operation of the ride as a result of, of this um, your uh, promotion? No, not, not in, a, in a negative uh, sense uh, at all actually. Uh, uh, I think for, for the people uh, at the attraction, I, I think the, what I've heard from, from the attraction department, of course you have the, the, the less vandalism in the queue line, but people are a bit more happy 
when, when entering uh, the ride off, they've been standing in the queue line for, for two hours because they have had something to do, they have something to talk uh, with the peers and, and, and to interact with. So, so it's, it's all positive aspects. Uh, when it comes to Helix, uh, the, the Helix app is, is not integrated technically with, with the ride as in, in Aerospin. So, so we, we're trying now with Aerospin to take it uh, an extra step. So, um, but we're aware about eventual complications of that because we wouldn't, we wouldn't allow that the, the app and the guest experience solution to, to, to interfere with the actual ride and, and especially security issues, which, which is very, very important for us. Okay, so I think we um, I think we've time for one more question, and it kind of picks up where you just left off, which is, um, can you talk about other attractions that you, that you might seek to have a, a gamification to? And both of the examples that you gave us were about new attractions that you were bringing in to the property, so there, it was a brand new offer for for guests. Um, how applicable do you think that that this, that strategy is for existing attractions in the park, taking like an older coaster that everybody's really familiar with? How applicable would that kind of strategy be? I think the strategy as, as such is applicable, but it's all depending on what, what you do with it. Uh, I would like to refer to Europa Park and, and some US parks now, uh, Six Flags and so on, that, that add a, a VR, uh, virtual reality uh, dimension. Uh, I, know, I don't know the exact numbers, but the Europa Park had a, an old coaster with uh, declining numbers, and they added this VR experience, and they actually managed to, to, to revitalize the, the, the whole ride and the whole experience. So that, that's, I think, is a quick uh, and an easy solution to do things. But in terms of developing integrated technical solutions on an old existing one, I think you should be uh, a bit careful. Uh, our issue now uh, is not talking about uh, adding uh, a digital dim dimension on every uh, individual uh, attraction, but also think about is there any general uh, perspective that we can do, do uh, a queue entertainment solution uh, to the guests, no matter what type of attraction you stand in line for. But that, that is actually our next challenge to do that. Uh, okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. And so, Erwin, Robert, thank you both for a couple of really great presentations. And uh, I want to, again, remind our audience that we've recorded our webinar, and you can get the recording and the PDF of the presentations up on the IAP uh, uh, website. We'll have another webinar uh, this time next week. Uh, it's uh, focused on uh, water park operations. It's looking at how you uh, things you should do to open your water park for the 2000. And 16 season, and of course, details on all our webinars can be found on the iApple webpage. I want to thank the audience for joining us today, and uh, again, Robert and Irwin, thank you very much, and uh, good day, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.